Within the lands between, there are many mysteries and secrets. Some are found within realms removed from the ordinary passage of time. Some within swamps of rot and decay, filled with knights that wander about without purpose or reason, corrupted by the very land with which they wade through. And some are found in plain sight, located in a castle that we are told we must conquer on our path to become Elden Lord. It is this castle, Castle Stormvale, that we are going to take a look at today, and within which has several secrets, some of which you may know about, and some of which you may not. Whichever it is, I hope you find this video informative and interesting. I ask that if you do, you like the video, and if you subscribe, enable notifications, or YouTube won't update you when I release more content like this. Elden Ring is a world full of lore, and I have a lot I want to talk about in future videos. Some of this video is theory based on in-game lore, and some my own speculation. Regardless, I hope you enjoy it. Now, let's explore Stormvale Castle, and the mysteries within. The first is to do with the appearance of the castle itself. I am sure you will have noticed it. The strange, gaping holes located within and without, in the interior courtyards and the exterior of the walls. Some in places that would seem to be inaccessible to conventional siege weaponry and the like. Moreover, take a look at these holes. Their appearance to me, it just seems off. They bore into the stone of the castle more like fissures or sores with a strange off coloration. If they were simple damage from some sort of siege engine, we would expect them to have broken the stone and left holes or large cracks in the wall. Instead, what it seems like is that something has eaten away at or corrupted the stonework starting at a single point and working its way in and radiating out, giving them a pockmark-like appearance, almost as if the castle has an illness or a cancer of sort, spreading through these wounds. Some of them are more like gaping slashes and could possibly be attributed to claw marks of a sort. This makes some sense in the region where we face Godric, as that dragon had to have gotten in somehow, and it flying in and then getting killed like an idiot and impaled seems more likely than somehow getting it through all the cramped corridors. But even then, some of these gashes look simply too large to have been caused by the size of dragon that is found here. So we must ask ourselves, what could have done this? What could have given the castle this strange appearance? Pockmark and sickly. And if it was from a siege, then by whom or what? Well, to provide answers to the latter, we have to seek them far to the east in a land of rot and ruin. To get an answer to the former, we have to go deeper, down, into the depths of the land. You've all heard the name of Star Scourge Radon, either from the various flavor texts in the game, NPC conversations, or because the bastard's name and health bar are burned into your monitor, as his boss battle has contributed to 37% of your deaths. He is one of the demigods, a child of Radagon and Renala, and said to be one of, if not the, strongest of the demigods. He challenged the very stars themselves and halted their motion. In doing so, given the link between the stars and fate itself in the lands between, he arrested the fate of others as well. Rani was one such individual, and it is for this reason that many of you likely fought him. Now, the how and why of his actions is long, complicated, and a topic that I am more than willing to expand on if you're interested in it. Suffice to say, his considerable power as a demigod and his mastery of gravity magic both played a part. It is this magic that interests us, as it allows him to call down a rain of meteorites on his enemies, large chunks of rock, superheated due to the massive amount of air friction generated as a result of their immense speed. He can also turn himself into a literal meteorite along with his horse. Now, remember the holes in the castle? Their strange, almost fluid appearance, as if something had blasted away the stone in waves, like molded clay. I bet superheated rocks thrown at high speed could definitely do that. Moreover, look at the castle from the Chapel of Anticipation. You know, without falling off. The entire side of it has been riddled with these holes. Now, given the extreme elevation of the castle, and the fact that, apart from a few wrecked ships, we aren't really given any information regarding the naval forces possibly employed in the conflict. I find it unlikely they were, uh, given the landlocked nature of most regions, and that dragons, magic, and angel wings pretty much make a large floating piece of wood a pretty shitty tactical move. 
So how then could this damage have been done? Well, I think meteors is a pretty good reason. But did Radan come here? What did he have to gain? He seemed to have his hands full with Kaelid due to him having halted the motion of stars to protect it. Or specifically Celia. Or at least that's one theory. Well, we actually get confirmation of this of a sort from some dialogue from Kenneth Height. The shifty shit you find in Eastern Limgrave. Honestly, Godric's nothing more than a jumped up country bumpkin. Lord? Oh, don't make me laugh. First, he hid himself amongst the women folk to flee the capital, then hid from Radan in that castle. Then he insulted Melania, lost to her in battle, only to lick her boots rather than die like a man. <laughs> Has he no shame? The big girl's blouse. So there we have it. Maybe not the most unbiased of viewpoints of Godric but at least a confirmation that he seemed to have specifically went to Stormvale to avoid Radon. And since he lost to Melania after this, given her battle with Radon, it may have taken place before the two of them clashed. You know, before Radon was as mad as a bag of spiders. Yeah. So the damage to the castle may very well have been bombardment via meteorites by Radon. Then at some point he got fed up with trying to coax the big girl's blouse out, and then just went back to Kayla to get half killed by a more directly related family member, as opposed to the diluted mutt that Godric was. But that's not the only possibility, is it? There is another, perhaps even more disturbing one, and it involves the strange corpse we can find deep, deep beneath the castle. The route I'm currently taking is the easiest way to get down. There is another one involving that annoying locked door, but I'm going to cover that towards the end of the video. For now, once we reach the bottom, we find this strange open-air corridor sandwiched between one of the inner walls and the foundations of the castle. It's just got some ordinary rats and then some absolute unit of a rat, as well as all these statues. Now, there's a few points in the game where people just seem to buck a whole load of statues in the nearest landfill, but given that many of them seem to depict a woman, I wonder if there isn't some link here between the statues and millennia. I say this because later in the game we find a, a certain item related to her, and we find it in a similar area of disposed of statues. Progressing a little further, we come across one of the hardest mini-boss fights in the game. The camera, I mean an ulcerated tree spurt. Now this thing is a nightmare to kill even if you have a wide open space to engage it in. Down here, it's a total ball ache. I recommend triggering it, then getting up the ladder at the back and using pots to cheese the fucker from a ledge you can find that looks down into this area. Suffice to say, the area is littered with corpses of other unfortunates that came down here, likely other tarnished and a few of the castle staff as well. And now these creatures are somewhat of an indirect result of the body, though that isn't exactly right to say that we find down here, and elsewhere in the game. Given the name tree spurts, they are some kind of creatures related to the Erd tree, or possibly the great tree likely in the same vein as the tree ashes that we can summon, which, as most of their text reads, are themselves hewn into the earth tree. So, as a result of the corruption that the tree itself seems to be going under, these creatures emerge, twisted amalgams of flesh and pus, senselessly attacking anything and everything they come into contact with. They're much more common in the earth tree capital, Lindell, and the reason for this is given to us by the item we find on here, the Prince of Death's Pustule a fetid pustule taken from facial flesh. It is said that this pustule came from the visage of the Prince of Death, he who used to be called Godwin. As first dead of the demigods, it's said he's buried deep under the capital, at the Erd Tree's roots. Now, from the actual image of this pustule, you can make out eyes and a nose, similar in appearance to the monstrosity that we find it beside. It takes on the appearance of a giant face, or at least the skin of it with eyeless sockets that look like they've had theirs torn out, and a strange mark in the center of the head. If you look closely, you can see what looks like a neck and arms emerging from the sides of it, almost as if this is the corpse of such a gargantuan beast. They seem to burrow deeper into the rock of the foundations of Stormvale Castle. However, this is not the Erd Tree capital, and this is not the Prince of Death, or even something that's technically alive, for that matter. If you look at what you probably thought are tentacles emerging from underneath it, you can actually see that they take on the appearance of roots, growing out from the main body of what is actually a plant, or at least a cancerous growth of a sort. 
You may actually recognize both the roots and the appearance of the pustule from similar growths present in some of the catacombs that you can dive into in the game. And, you know, the spiked roots that rip through your innards and spit roast you when those little bassless bastards cough on you. Which, not coincidentally, is exactly what this bloodstain here shows happening to Roger. Now, you need to interact with this bloodstain in order to trigger his quest, and after this, you see the effect of these roots beginning to destroy both his mind and his body. His is a story we will cover another time, but it bears mentioning for now, as he tells us that the thing down here did it. He also states that this body, or corpse, as he calls it, is a sacred relic from what he refers to as the Black Knives plot. This is actually odd, as these growths, like all those we encounter, is completely inert, and the ulcerated tree spirits can't, oddly enough, inflict the death blight effect on you. So how was he actually afflicted is an odd question, almost as odd as who the corpse that has the pustule on it belonged to, given that they would have had to come all the way from the body of Godwin. Which brings us to our next point. What the fuck is this thing? Now I'm going to preface this next part with a warning. I'm going to drop a lot of names and events here, and we don't have even remotely enough time to go into detail about all of them. So, I'm going to have to summarise. And if there's something you really want to know about, leave a comment and I'll try and make a dedicated video about them. Or it. So as you will remember, Godwin was the first demigod to die, killed in the Night of Black Knives by the assassins wielding blades imbued with the power of the Rune of Death, which was stolen by Ronnie the Witch, which was previously stealed by Marika in order to lock away Death and Death, and as such, ushered in immortality to the lands between. Now I know what you're thinking. What the fuck is everything I just mentioned? Well, it's a lot. And to be frank, we don't have time to cover it all in this, or even just one whole other video. All you need to know is Godwin was the first to die, and he was indeed buried under the Erdry capital, in a place called the Deep Root Depths, which, again, whole other video. However, while his soul died, his body did not, shown to us in the cinematic trailer before the game was released. As a result, his body, under the effects and the influence of the Rune of Death, began to spread into and corrupt the roots of the Great Tree and the land it was surrounded by. This eventually led to Death Root spreading into the lands, the rise of those who live in death, and the condemnation of those same individuals by both the Golden Order and the Beast Hunters. And it also led to these growths. You heard me. These are the growths that spread out from the corpse of Godwin the Golden, spreading the corruption of death throughout the land likely making up for lost time given its long absence from the region. The heads match the now appearance of Godwin's body, and the long neck and arms that we see are actually more roots, spreading out and reaching for things to burrow into and spread into. This may have been what happened to Roger, and we just never get to experience it in game, but we can't be sure. Now if you'll remember, I suggested this as a possible explanation for the state of the castle. All of those holes and bores take on the appearance, at least to me, of rotting flesh, of sores, spreading out as a result of a sickness. Given the location of this growth here, it may be that it itself has played a role in this, infecting the very castle itself, possibly as a precursor to the state that many of the catacombs are in, and other areas that those who live in death dwell. If this is the case, then eventually, all of Stormvale Castle will rot, and one day be a towering structure of pustules and roots spreading death to all who come across it. More examples of this spreading corruption can, in fact, be found in the castle. You will remember the large amount of holes visible from the Chapel of Anticipation. Well, along with the holes, we can also make out a large amount of roots, or thorn-like protrusions, spreading out from those rotted points. The largest concentration on the external of the castle, and indeed the most holes as well, is actually situated above where the growth from Godwin can be found. This makes sense as, if it is causing them, the volume would be highest above it. Looking closer at them, they don't take on the same appearance as Death Root itself. However, their presence is hard to explain besides that. Even more interesting, the walls of the castle are not the only thing that has been corrupted by these thorns. The soldiers have as well. You may not have noticed, but all the exiles throughout the castle have these thorns growing all over, and even into, their armour. 
It may be that they are burrowing into the flesh as well. Parts of the armor seem to also be displaying a type of corruption, or rot, similar to the castle walls. You can see this most of all at the joints. Now how this has influenced them in regards to behavior is unknown at this time. They still seem to retain enough of themselves to fight, use tools, and follow orders. Also play a sick tune on a horn. But it's a piece of equipment they have that could possibly confirm exactly what is happening in the castle. The marred wooden and leather shields. They read as follows. Shield of the Stormveil soldiers. Much like the castle, it is marred by mottling and thorns. Some say it is the curse of grafting which causes such affliction, while others talk of its roots being something altogether more sinister, hidden deep within the castle. These shields bear both the rot the castle does, called mottling in the item description, and the thorns that also adorn and pierce both the castle and the soldiers. Not only that, it literally makes reference to a sinister secret hidden deep within Stormveil. The growth of Godwin falls into that category. I think we can all agree. Now it could be the grafting also plays a role as well. We don't know if it can also curse people. I mean, it was outlawed for a reason, remember. But I think these shields linking the thorns to the rot, along with the proximity of both to the area above the growth under the castle, makes it very likely that it is the prime cause of them. I do, however, think it's also still likely that Radon could have played a role in wrecking the place, mind you, as there's no reason the rot couldn't have simply taken root in the weakened parts of the castle that he himself assailed. But overall, the creeping influence of Deathroot and Godwin seems to be to blame, infecting both the castle and its denizens. To what end? We don't know, but it's unlikely to be a good one. Our next piece of lore comes from a question regarding the ruler of Stormvale Castle. Or should I say the once ruler of Stormvale Castle, the Stormlord. Information regarding this individual is sparse, but I think, given some descriptions, in-game dialogue, and appearance of the items themselves, we can actually get a good idea of who, or should I say what, it is, centering in on two primary theories. The first is in regards to the in-game item description of Stormhawks. Spirit of a Stormveil Warhawk, the talons of which have been sliced off so that razor-fine swords could be grafted in their place. With its lord vanquished and its wings wounded, the hawk perished as it solemnly gazed at its former home. The storm is a warhawk's cradle. Now it states the cradle of the stormhawks is the storm itself. Moreover, from in-game item descriptions of their feathers, they are native to Stormveil Castle. At present, it appears that they are the victims of a process similar to grafting, though in their case it was simply blades attached where their talons once were as opposed to the actual process of physically grafting another's flesh onto oneself, which, as we know, is the end result of what most grafting is known for. So these were a creature that was native to the region of Stormveil, which borders Limgrave and Lyernia, and around which an eternal storm does seem to rage. Perhaps not as strong as some we have seen, but that may be just an effect of the passage of time. Now one of the only in-game mentions we get regarding the Stormlord the original ruler of Stormvale, is in regards to Godfrey the Golden, the first consort the Queen Marika had, and the previous Elden Lord to boot. At some point in the past, they had a confrontation with the Stormlord, and they came out victorious, vanquishing them, and presumably securing Stormvale as territory for their descendants. Indeed, despite Kenneth Hite's disparaging remarks, Godric does indeed seem to be a descendant of Godfrey, even if he, in comparison to the man himself, is diluted to fuck. But if God revanquished the Stormlord, what exactly were they? Well, I believe that's just like with regards to the damage to the castle. The Chapel of Anticipation holds some answers for us. Within it, after we return using the portal located at the Belfries, we can find a door beside the chapel that was once locked, now opened. Within, we can locate the spirit ash of the Stormhawk King, which reads as follows. Ashes of a hawk revered by all others as sovereign, back in the days when Stormveil's winds still raged like no others. This ancient monarch is proud, however, refusing to answer anyone's summons. So there was literally a king of the Stormhawks, who reigned over all of them back in the days when the storms were unparalleled in Stormveil. It seems likely then, 
given that the birds were once the natives of the region, that the Stormhawk King would be the Storm Lord, right? I mean, these were literally a species of bird that, from their spirit ashes, seem to have been born inside the storms themselves, and likely lived in them as well, so the strongest among them would be worthy of the title of the Storm Lord. Two more spirit ashes give us some information regarding the castle and its lord. The first is the spirit ash of Stormhawk Deenth. Spirit of a fierce hawk that faithfully rendered lifelong service to the old king of Stormvale long ago, when the true storm raged. Its cries embolden its fellows in battle, and the tempestuous winds that encircle it shred the foes. The second spirit ash is that of banished knight Engval, one of the two knights dubbed the Wings of the Storm. Despite his banishment, he rejected the invitation of the grace-given lord, instead keeping watch over the masterless castle for many years, gaining renown as a hero of the fringes. Now, the grace-given lord is surely Godfrey, which means at some point an invitation was extended to Engval, the details of which we can only speculate. However, since his decision was then to keep watch over Stormvale, then the invitation must have required him to leave. Now, he was known as one of the wings of the storm, and since banished knights, and indeed most of the other exiles of Stormvale, all utilised storm-based ashes of war, then they could have, at one point, followed a master that excelled in the utilisation of the storm as a weapon. And who else would this be better suited to than the mightiest of Stormhawks? In relation to the Stormhawk King's sovereignty over Stormvale, there's actually some quest-related evidence for this. However, it was absent from the game as caught content, until version 1.03 came out. If you give the Stormhawk King's actions to Nefeli Lu, you get this conversation. No, no, no. How could I say that? Father has always given me his guidance. And now... I've lost it. Is that ash? I can smell the ancient storm in it. My thanks. I'll gladly take it. I'm not like Roderica. I don't feel the presence of spirits, let alone see them. Still, this ash, it reminds me of my first hawk. Thank you. In this ash, I can smell the ancient storm. It reminds me of my first hawk. Despite the fact that she herself states that she has no talent for either the sensing or the sight of spirits, she still manages to feel the ancient storm inside the ashes of this king. Now, it could just be because she's a warrior, and so the Stormhawk King has decided that she is worthy to wield him. But there is more to it. The actual name of Godfrey the Golden is Horalu a name he retakes when he casts aside the spectral lion Sarosh, which contained his loss for battle. Given the same second name, and that he was exiled from the lands between by Marika before the shattering of the Elden Ring, it does seem likely that he sired other heirs. I mean, we know Godric was related to him, yet we know nothing about the children of Marika and Godfrey. So perhaps she is his descendant, and due to Godfrey having vanquished the Stormhawk King originally, it sensed this in her, and decided that she was worthy. However, all of her story is one for another day. It's what happens after this that is interesting. If you clear Kenneth's keep and give her the Stormhawk King, and kill Morgoth, the fell omen, then they will both return to the throne room that you couldn't fight in, behind the graveyard you fight Godric in, along with Gostok, though we'll get to him later. Kenneth decides that Nefeli is the rightful heir to Limgrave, Given that this happens after you give her the Stormhawk King, it is reasonable to conclude that the wielding of this ash qualified her in some way, and what's more of a qualification for leadership than the original king saying, you're worthy. It is likely also that if the Stormhawk King acknowledged her, then that proved in some way that she was a descendant of Godfrey, and if Godric was good enough, well then, so was she. That's one theory, anyway. The other, in my opinion, has far less backing to it, but it's interesting. So I'll talk about it anyway. If you look at the helms of the banished knights, you may notice that, atop them, a strange looking dragon adorns them. It has an unusual appearance, with horns that, thus far, in the lands between, there are no equal for, and what appears to be feathers. 
Given that we know that Engval was one of the wings of the storm, it could be that the reason this adorns the helmets is that this was the Storm Lord, a great dragon. This could be why, when we first encounter Godric, he refers to the dragon he has the corpse of as the True Born Heir. If he was referring to Stormveil, then this dragon could be a descendant of the Storm Lord, or that he knows that some dragon is the True Born Heir, and that he just assumes this one is related to it in some way. This may also explain why the Exiles and the Banished Knights are also found in Far Missoula, where another storm rages, and dragons hold dominion. Now, given that we take on a previous Elden Lord there, Placidious Axe, whom we shall cover another day, I think it's safe to say it probably wasn't him. Yes, he lives inside of a storm removed from time, but he looks nothing like the Hamlets, and the relocation to Far Missoula makes no sense. You could also argue that this may explain the presence of the Beastman near the castle, but I think there isn't much of a link, and that was more of a wait until this thing's a common enemy sort of encounter. Honestly, I just think the Stormhawk King has far more evidence. The alternative is the Storm Lord is some random person that we never encounter or get any other evidence to the identity of in the game. And that's just not interesting. Next, we have Roderica, the frightened young woman outside Storm Hill that eventually makes her way to the Round Table Hold and becomes a spirit tuner under the instruction of a kindly misbegotten blacksmith. However, the story of how she got here is quite horrifying and our interaction with her leaves a lot of it out. The rest is told to us in item descriptions and the environment of Stormville Castle itself. But first, let's have a listen to the conversation we get the first time with her. Everyone's been grafted. Everyone who came with me. They crossed the sea for me. They fought for me. <laughs> Only to have their arms taken. Their legs taken, even their heads taken. Taken and stuck to the spider. Did you know, if you're grafted by the spider, you become a chrysalid? It's quite a lark when you think about it. You're all on your own, are you? And heading to Stormvale Castle, enticed by the one in the white mask, I suppose. Oh, you've come to be one with the spider? Well, that makes us two peas in a pod. But I don't have your courage. It's scary, you know, having your arms cut off. Or legs. Or your head. I want to be like everyone else, but I'm just too scared. I'm nothing but a craven. Oh, I know. Can you take this little one along with you? Nothing deserves someone braver than myself. And the spirits look rather fondly upon you. It'll be glad of your company, I think. The little one. It was a pleasure to see you. Oh, can you pass on a message for me? If you see the little chrysalids in Stormvale Castle, tell them I love them. And that, despite my craven heart, I'm sure I'll be joining their club soon enough. I'm finally getting the hang of this whole pain thing, you know. She mentions that she and her travelling companions were on their way to Stormvale to become one with the spider via the process of grafting, as we find out later. This is where the removal of limbs or other such parts of the body come into it. Now, the spider is definitely Godric, but it's worth mentioning that even this horrific, sad goal may have been too lofty of one for them. There are several other creatures that are the result of grafting, and there's really no guarantee that they would have become one with Godric, or even used at all, you know, given the amount of disturbing meat chandeliers we see hanging from the roof of the dining hall. However, it's her comments about her companions already going in that's the real question here. What are the chrysalids that she keeps talking about? Well, in the room off to the side of where you battle the grafted scion, we can find a dead troll strung up over a pile of corpses, and underneath, we find the chrysalis memento. The item itself tells us that the faint spirits of the dead can be seen in it, and if we give this to Roderica, she herself will move to the round table hold. However, the question remains, what are the chrysalids? Well, chrysalid is another word for chrysalis, and chrysalis is the term used for the pupate sage of many insects. 
wherein they reside in the cocoon, and undergo a sort of metamorphosis. Well, look around you. This place is simply covered in cocoons. Yes, the chrysalids that she referred to were the corpses of her companions. The chrysalis stage she was talking about was after they were dead, but before they were grafted onto something else. Honestly, given that some of them still talk to her through the memento, and her ability to see spurts, maybe to her this made sense. It seems odd and grotesque the way she tells us to tell them she'll see them soon, almost if it's a coping mechanism to deal with the fact that all her companions are dead, and she was the one who abandoned them and left them to die. If we come back here later, after she has lost her hood in the round table hold, we can find it where we find the memento. It reads, A hooded cloak of vivid crimson, worn by expatriated loyalty. Such cloaks were gifted to those who had departed on journeys without specific orders, to faraway lands from which they would never return. In other words, the gift of a cloak made it easier for undesirables to be on their way. Roderica never once saw the Guidance of Grace. Now as we know, the Guidance of Grace is something many tarnished see that pulls them to the lands between. They dictate the machinations of the Two Fingers and the Greater Will, which we shall, again, have to get into another time. However, while many tarnished lost sight of the Guidance of Grace when they came to the Lands Between, they all supposedly have it to guide them here. But in Roderica's case, she never did. And her cloak seems to indicate that, wherever she came from, the people there just wanted rid of her. They gave her a cloak that would help her a little bit, and tossed her out on her hole. This may have been because of her ability to see spirits. Outside of the Lands Between, this is likely not a common ability, nor would spirits likely be a common sight due to their link to the Erd Tree. So, after she came here, she, intelligently, as far as I'm concerned, refused to get her limbs pulled off and grafted to some body horror to facilitate the machinations of a sick old man. As a result, her companions were the only ones to die. Now, her reference to them as chrysalids may be because she's seen their death as just another incubation stage, as they would become spirits and as such she probably considers them still alive in some way in the grafted creatures that we encounter. Honestly, due to the nature of destined death and death roots spreading throughout the land, even me describing them as dead isn't really an accurate description. More like their chance to pass into the air tree was taken from them. We'll get more into grafting another time. But Roderica is the only survivor, and it's only after she finds her calling as a spirit tuner that she returns to Stormfield. Laying down the cloak that she was given and cast out in, on the corpses of her companions, maybe as a way to apologize to them, and perhaps to let the little chrysalids know that she's going to be okay now, and they don't need to worry about her anymore. The final thing I want to talk about, at least in direct regards to major lore of characters, is Gatekeeper Gostock. Love or hate him, you've encountered him, and you've been far more intimate with him, or at least he has been with you, than you may be aware of. We find him off to the left of the great gate into Stormvale, which he offers to open for us, but warns us of the dangers of venturing through. Instead, he tells us of a safer path, one that avoids the ballistic defences. However, this is all to serve his own ends, and he wants you to cut your way through the castle and collect runes. You see, at several points throughout Stormvale, most creepily, as far as I'm concerned, above the tower where we meet Roger, Gostock stalks you. This is not directly to harm you, you understand. A a apart from, you know, that, that one time when he pulled up patches and kicked you into a dark room with the Banished Knight. No. This is to rob your corpse, and to collect some of the runes that you leave behind in death. You may not have noticed, but when you die in Stormvale Castle, when you retrieve your runes, they aren't all there. About 20-25% to 25 of them are missing. This is because Gostock has been watching you the whole time, and when you die, he rifles through your corpse. This is also likely how he amassed his little shop as well, from the bodies of other tarnished who came to Stormvale Castle to claim a great rune. Another thing of note is his role in the castle. Despite appearing as a lowly gatekeeper, or at least he claims he is one, he somehow manages to make it around the castle without issue. This is despite the considerable layers of defence that have been set up and seem to be manned almost entirely by the exiles and banished knights. The others of his kind just sit around in what seems like total despair, yet he's the only one that actively lures others into situations where he can take advantage of their demise and rob them. Moreover, his left hand is missing, which was once a popular and 
you know, completely reasonable and proportional punishment for thievery. This could indicate that he has been caught doing this before and just doesn't give a fuck. The why of this, the why of him wanting these runes, is possibly answered when we encounter him after killing Godric. For a lord you were. <laughs> Craven to the bone. Pushing me about like that. And after all that grafting, where did that get you? Look down on me, would ya? Godric, you filthy slug. Feel it. Feel it. Feel my bloody wrath. Oh. Hello there. This weasel was... Godric was always looking down on me. He got what he bloody deserved thanks to you. I tell you though, what goes around comes around. He had an ugly heart, an uglier countenance, and met the ugliest of ends, eh? <laughs> I suppose I'm free. I can do whatever takes my fancy. <laughs> can I, mate? The first thing this shows us is the extent to which the grafting affected Godric. His actual body was of a similar size to our own, which really highlights just how much he had done. Very, very little of what we saw was even remotely like himself. But also of interest is how Gostok is reacting. He genuinely seems to hate Godric, more so than one would expect of someone who's just meant to be a random servant. He states that Godric was looking down on him, that he was personally taking note of and going out of his way to make Gostok's life worse off. This is odd as there doesn't really seem to be a reason why he would do this, or even have any contact with the gatekeeper. Despite this, Gostok does seem to genuinely hate him, and relishes the fact that, despite all his grafting, which Gostok may have also been a victim of. It was all for naught, and he can finally let Godric experience his bloody wrath, which means stamping on his corpse like a bitch. However, thanks to the fantastic dynamiters in the community, we now know more. Zuli the Witch, who runs a fantastic channel that looks into the game files to find all sorts of juicy information, has an excellent video on this. I've linked the video and their channel, should you want to hear the actual dialogue. Buried within the game files are several pieces of cut dialogue for Gostok. The first is one in which he proclaims himself as Godric's son and heir. The second makes a request of us for the crown of Godric. Presumably, at one point, we would have been able to crown Gostok as the King of Stormvale. This quest seems to have been replaced by the one in which we instead place Nefeli Lu on the throne instead, who is, as we have discussed, a much more worthy ruler. If this happens, Gostok says he can serve her. However, he still makes reference to looting the bodies of those who fall in Stormvale Castle. I will point out here that there is an excellent reason not to kill him, as if you get to this point, his shop improves considerably, and you will want the items he sells, one of which is an ancient dragon smithing stone. Of course, this still leaves the question of why he was looting bodies and amassing runes. I believe the reason is likely because he, at some point, wanted to challenge Godric and take his great rune for himself. However, as far as we are aware, Gostok is maidenless, which raises the question of how he was planning to actually make use of those runes. He may have been aware of a maiden with whom he can make use of, or perhaps Melina had made contact with him at some point. Another possibility is that, despite the hate he displays in front of us, he didn't really want his father to die. So harvesting runes from those who came to claim his head and great rune were his way of weakening them and preventing them from hurting his father. We may never know which it was. One last thing I want to talk about is in regards to the Book of Godslayer incantations and the Godslayer seal. We obtained both via use of a swordstone key in the courtyard with the banished knights that utilize the flamethrowers. These are items I am sure many of you have found, though you may not have made use of them. Now the story of the Godslayer incantations, the Black Flame, the Godskin Nobles, and the God Hunt are for a whole other video. Maybe three. To briefly summarize, the Godskin Apostles are a group that utilize a flame called the Black Flame, 
which has, or had, a unique property outside of a regular fire. The most significant of these was the ability to kill gods. Now, it supposedly lost this ability when death and death was sealed. However, if the flame lost power after death was sealed, then I have to question why a unique flame was required to kill the gods before that happened, given that, up to that point, they weren't immortal. But that is all for another video. All you need to know is that these individuals wear garments of skin and want to kill the gods. They all make use of this flame. The Godskin prayer book itself is bound in skin and contains two incantations. The seal itself is not required to use the incantations, but either the obsidian stone, possibly linked to the flame itself, or the seal enhances them. So why are these here? It's a question that, from a gameplay point of view, can be easily answered to give the player cool fire to commit arson with. But from the perspective of the lore, we have to speculate. I see one of three possibilities. The first is Gostok. He scavenges corpses, and on some level, despised Godric and possibly wanted him dead. So he gathered the tools with which he could do so. What better tool than a seal that allows the use of a flame that is said to destroy the gods themselves? Godric, being the diluted sop he is, wouldn't stand a chance in the face of such power. A wandering cleric, or perhaps a godskin noble themselves, could have wielded this, and been killed and subsequently had their body looted. Second, Godric himself wanted the power. He had already lost and fled from many of the other gods, and had taken such drastic measures to make himself stronger. Why not make use of a flame that the gods themselves fear, that is used to literally hunt and kill the gods, or at least it was. I see this as being more likely than Gostok, given where we found the book and seal, and that it would have been difficult for Gostok to gather that and hide it. Lastly is the Godskin Apostles themselves. We know that grafting was an old and abhorrent practice, one that was outlawed a long time ago. We know that the Godskin Apostles have unique physiology, one that involved them utilizing the characteristics of other creatures to enhance their combat ability. Sound familiar? It seems like they either use an art related to or is in fact grafting. If so, given his lust for power, it's not completely impossible to think that Godric could have brought the Godskin Apostles in, as consultants of a sort, teach him the ways of grafting in exchange for the skin of his subjects? The answer to that will require delving into them another time. Before you leave, I would like to ask you, if you've gotten this far, to give a like if you enjoyed the video as it helps with performance. If you want more content like this, please leave suggestions in either the comments or on my Twitter, which I've linked in the description. If this is your first time on the channel, you'll probably have noticed that I do a lot of content on Fallout. It's in a similar vein to this video's style, and if you've enjoyed any of the Fallout games, I think you'll enjoy my other content. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, goodbye.